I'm Peter Ellison, John Cole's Professor of Anthropology and Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard and co-editor of the Annual Review of Anthropology. And I'm talking today with my longtime mentor and friend, Professor Irvin DeVore, the Ruth B. Professor of Anthropology Emeritus at Harvard University. Professor DeVore and I have known each other for all of my professional career and a good portion of his. Professor DeVore, your, your career has been truly remarkable. It reads as if it were three people's careers, <laughs> uh, covering some of the most pivotal events and, uh, in biological anthropology, including uh, primate behavior, hunter-gatherer studies, uh, and the introduction of evolutionary theory into the understanding of human behavior. Uh, and yet you were trained as a social anthropologist. I'd like to start, if we might, uh, by asking you to recall uh, the beginning of your relationship with the late Cherry Washburn and explain to us how you ever decided to study the social behavior of baboons. Well, it was an accident, really. I, uh, I was a social anthropology major as an undergraduate at the University of Texas and, and was admitted in the social program at Chicago graduate school uh, and all I ever intended to do. Uh, and at the end of my first year, uh, I went out to do field work with some Meskwaki Indians and uh, had uh, quite an eventful summer. Uh, but, uh, but one that was not terribly satisfying. I, I, it began to, I began to think seriously about social anthropology and whether I was really fitted for it. Uh, <clears throat> and I've been equally interested in animals since I was young. I think at the age of six I had 25 different animals. Uh, <laughs> my parents are very long-suffering. <laughs> and I've always been interested in their behavior, just understanding their behavior. So I, I did um, I was a social anthropology major as an undergraduate and then uh, was admitted in that to, to Chicago. And I had never given any thought to uh, animal behavior as a, a serious enterprise, as a hobby. Uh, I didn't know you could do that even. Uh, I came from a pretty <laughs> impoverished part of East Texas. And, uh, <clears throat> but during that summer, of field work uh, my first, after my first year. I had a summer out on the Meskwaki Indian settlement, Tama, Iowa. And for the first time, I had to confront seriously what it was like to do serious social anthropology. And I began to feel more and more that I was not suited for it. I, uh, at least the way she was understood at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, well, uh, this feeling grew over the years, and i explain that slightly. The, when I felt like I was not ready to be a really good parent until I was about 40. Now, that's a strange time in the human career, but by then I knew that in our culture, a good parent had to fill in for the aunts, the aunts and uncles, the grandparents, the nephews, the nieces, the cousins, all of those people who were a support group. We take, we, we banish, so to speak, our nuclear families to isolation in tall apartment buildings. And anyone who's had a child with a colic for two straight nights and is trying to go to graduate school and so on knows why the temptation is almost overwhelming to smother it or do something. Well, of course, in our, uh, for millions of years, or hundreds of thousands of years, we had this tight social group around us, and the, almost immediately when the mother was getting frazzled, one of these women, I was almost usually a woman, would come over, take the baby, feed it, and calm it down, maybe sleep with it. Mm -hmm. We don't have that, and, and we can't. We'd, we don't even think that we should be prepared to give those kind of things. And, well, then I thought, well, social anthropology is, is wearing on me because I don't think that the people who write up 
the uh, monographs uh, are really prepared to do it. I mean, they're just too young. I mean, here you have a graduate student just out of college, uh, probably about 22, 20, anyway, early, mid-20s, going out to a strange place. Maybe they've never been more than two states away from home. And here they are in Fiji. And they're sitting and talking to people who are grandparents and parents since they were 14, and, all, and so on, and trying to understand them. Well, in fact, of course, what happens is the anthropologist discovers herself or himself reflected in all of these conversations. But that's, you're not allowed to write that up, or you shouldn't, because who wants to read about brown-skinned Americans, you know, so to speak? Uh, so you've got to find an angle. And always the anthropologist finds an angle, which is new. It's an it's, it's original contribution to knowledge. Well, I'm, I'm rattling on about this, but uh, I came to feel it very strongly. I never gave up that feeling, really. Uh, of course, there are people who can rise above those limitations, but uh, it's a serious limitation. And the other thing that bothered me particularly was that as opposed to science, where if you perform an experiment and find something novel and it's important, Five or six other people are down to the labs early the next morning trying to replicate it. Whereas in anthropology, if you dare to go to the village that some anthropologist has been to before, you're ridden out of the profession. That's just not a gentlemanly thing to do. Well, so what are we, what are we left with? A gazillion individual accounts of cultures and no comparative work at all. Well, that was the mood I was in uh, when I came back from that field work. And Saul Tax, who was a marvelous man, uh, one of the great men of the 20th century in many, many ways. But anyway, he, he was head of something called Action Anthropology, which we were doing out in Muskoka country, Tema. Uh, by the way, they were called Sack and Fox during the Plains Indian days, and they're all, they call themselves Muskoka, so. I'm sorry if I confuse people. Uh, we talked about my experience, and he said, well, you know, we kind of like you to take over the project. Well, th this is very flattering. I thought, wow, this may be my big chance. So I said, let me think about it over the weekend. Uh, and Saul and I had gotten to be very close. So I come back in, and I said, no, I'm just not the person to do that. He says, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you like animals? I said, I love animals. He said, I want you to meet someone. And we walk down the hall. He opens the door, puts his hand in the middle of my back, and shoves me and says, Sherry, here's your man. <laughs> and turns and leaves. And here's a guy I've never seen before. Turns out to be Sherwood Washburn, one of the two or three most eminent uh, physical anthropologists in America. Bounds up out of his chair uh, and comes over and shakes my hand and so on. He says, so you're going to be my teaching fellow. I said, uh, well, there's some mistake. Uh, I, I had four years of public speaking in high school and four more in college, and proved, you know, I was a national debate champion and so on. I don't feel like I need the teaching experience, and I have a fellowship that pays all of my expenses. I, I, I just don't want to do it. I mean, I'd rather devote my. He said, I didn't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Sherry. That's Sherry. Uh, Sherry was a man of strong opinions, uh, but he was not usually that brusque. Anyway, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Within a few, oh, two or three weeks, really, I just adored the man. He had more ideas per day than I had heard from all my other contacts in anthropology in my whole career, which was not that long. But he just spun ideas off, and they were original, and they were fun. And they were not all true or all even worth following up. But uh, part of your job or your graduate student job was to help separate the dross from the gold. Uh, anyway, he was just so exciting to be around. Uh, and if he, had, if he had tried to recruit me to go to, oh, I don't know, on a Mars 
expedition mm -hmm. and study paramecia, I would have done it. Uh, if he said it was important, I would know it was. Uh, <coughs> well, um, the interesting thing is that he had just come back from a uh, field trip in Africa and Excuse me, he was over there watching, well, he was over there uh, doing anatomy on baboons. They were doing Burman control operations and bringing these baboons in. And he got so interested in watching their behavior, he would dissect a baboon very quickly. Then he would have a day to sit on the veranda of the Victoria Falls Hotel and drink Pim's number ones and, and watch the baboons in the garden. And they just so fascinated him. He came back, he was determined to get somebody to study behavior of baboons. And the way he explained it to me was, he said, you know, primates are wonderful. And by the way, he had been on the original uh, Asia, Asiatic primate expedition, ape, <laughs> uh, with uh, Adolf Schultz and uh, C. Ray Carpenter. He was the graduate student from mm. Harvard who was on it. So he, you know, he watched behavior off and on for various reasons. And uh, he said, but you know, nobody who is interested or, or is sophisticated about behavior has ever studied primate. It's always uh, a physiological psychologist or an experimental psychologist or whatever. Uh, I want somebody who is accustomed to thinking about complex social organizations because that's what they've got. So I said, well, I'm your man. And well, I had a wonderful time in Kenya, but they, uh, and Sherry joined me toward the end. His family and my family then were out there together for a little while. But uh, it's hard to, hard to tell you how isolated, how <laughs> pioneering I felt. Mm. Nobody was studying animal behavior in any country. Uh, that is seriously studying it. I, when I finally taught my first course in primate behavior at Berkeley, uh, I didn't have a single book on primates to assign. Uh, and uh, so I signed virtually every good monograph there was on animal behavior, and I fill a small show. F. Fraser Darling on the Red Deer. Bartholomew and Birdsell on elephant seals. Uh, J.P. Scott on sheep. I mean, you know, well, <laughs> that was a very good way to approach primates in a way, but uh, when I got to Africa, there was nobody studying animals in Africa or filming them. The best film was one called the African Lion, and, and for its day, it was wonderful. First really good animal behavior film to come out of the wild. It was shot by two amateur who were a retired couple. And they just camped at a water hole for three years and shot hot lion footage and came back and got help editing it. And it was wow. great. You also used film in your own studies of baboons. And people in my generation grew up watching <laughs> Irvin DeVore's 16 millimeter baboon behavior films. Yes, uh, well, as in so many things, uh, uh, Sherry Washburn was behind that. He was uh, absolutely determined that other people see these fabulous animals that had so turned him on. And it, so he wanted me to make a film at, on our, my first study. And I uh, didn't have a camera, but I finally figured out that there were these cameramen, amateur cameramen in Nairobi, Kenya, who would go out and shoot the great white hunter potting his lion or his elephant. And I hired one of these guys for a week, and we went out every day and and shot footage, and I came back and edited it, and uh, it, it got what they called, a, a, <laughs> a grandiosely, the Oscar in those years. It was uh, the Blue Ribbon and the, uh, I don't know, but uh, educational film, <laughs> whatever. Uh, there was one of those that I remember. I also had a botanist with me from the uh, museum because I was identifying the plants that they ate and I had some that I didn't have samples of. And we pulled up by this little pool and there's this lioness just across it. And the pool was no bigger than this room, hardly this big. And she was very close to the other side and we were, so I wanted a water lily that the baboons eat. So I, I get out, or I, I start to get out and she hunkers down and growls. And I think, is she bluffing? <laughs> 
and, and how much do I want to know? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll try a little bit more. So I opened the door a little bit more and put one leg out, and she cowers again. And the guy is sweating uh, buckets. He, he says, N -n never mind, I know, the spe I know the genus, we can just let the species go. <laughs> That's fine. Well, uh, years later when I was working in Cambridge with a very, very heads up group called Education Development Center, mm -hmm. uh, we got uh, an extraordinary man at MIT named Gerald Zacharias. Uh, was decided to siphon off some of the large amounts of money being thrown at the curriculum after Sputnik went up. I mean, America panicked. Why aren't our kids in our, you know? And he thought, you know, one of the things that needs help most is not just math and engineering, it's the social sciences. So a group at Harvard, uh, and I hired a lot of helpers, uh, started this very ambitious project we were going to do kindergarten through 12th grade social studies. Boy, were we naive. Uh, <clears throat> but we, uh, as part of this, they, they hired me to basically to do the baboon story for fifth graders. Mm. And they got a lot of money to do film. Uh, in, in Washington, by the way, there was a unit of measurement called the ZAC. The Zach was $250,000 because that was the smallest amount he would talk in terms of in any budget he was negotiating. <laughs> anyway, Zach got me money. And uh, I was able to hire a top Disney photographer, director, and sound man, and so on, and we did it right. Uh, and uh, I used those films for many, many years, particularly in my case, and th this is proven to be what's uh, lasted about them, to show the individuality in the mm -hmm. ones. It was easier to show in the males because they were so bravura, uh, but it was true in the females as well. Uh, and I showed that in a film called Dynamics of Male Dominance, which was not for fifth graders. I made all these films for fifth graders, and then I said, may I make one <laughs> for, my, for my peer group, so to speak? Uh, and I've, I, I also trained them, uh, I, I used them, we took them in real time yep. and uh, w with the wild, with sound, of course. First time any of us knew, Disney knew, because uh, this was his big animal ma director, uh, that synchronized sound had ever been taken in the wild. I always they laid the soundtrack in separately. Which is why you get elephants yawning, and the and the soundtrack is trumpeting, you know. <laughs> and uh, vultures uh, are symbolic; they, they hover uh, in a dead tree over the dead animal or person. And well, it's silent death. Vultures are among the noisiest animals on earth, and they fight over every scrap, and it's a cacophonous sound. So kids in the fifth grade began to get the idea of, oh, and we didn't put any sound, uh, sorry, uh, narration on the films. We showed them really authentic films, and they were just so eager to know more. And we said, well, we have these booklets, you know, here's a booklet on organization, here's a booklet on child development, infant development, mm -hmm. so on and so on. Well, I could go on talking, as you can see, all day about that. but. Uh, it, there is no way to bring home the animal you're talking about better than a film. I mean, it certainly it, did that. In many ways, better than having them visit you out there because that, first of all, you'll get a very small sample for that person, uh, and you very likely will disturb the animals in some way, et cetera. And very likely that you'd have to wait a long time to see the, the behaviors of interest. That's right. true. I wonder if we can skip ahead, though, because it strikes me that at the same time, through your work with the baboons, through your interaction with the, the community of e European, primarily, ethologists who were studying animal behavior, uh, all of this was, was making your name synonymous with primate behavior within anthropology. Uh, even as that was happening, 
you were launching something else and something equally new. Uh, based on your relationship with uh, Richard Lee and Sherry again, I believe, uh, the, you started to launch the, the Kalahari project, study of the, the Kung San Bushmen in Botswana. And this project also broke tremendous uh, new ground and, and I, I think established a new paradigm for field work, uh, breaking the mold of that, that one anthropologist, one culture paradigm that you were mentioning before. Uh, people. Yeah. You guys decided to bring a team of experts, not, not, not a SWAT team all at once, but rotating through people studying child development and demography and, and uh, uh, archaeology and all kinds of uh, things to build up a really multi-layered, multidisciplinary view. How did, how did this strategy well, come to be? Uh, again, it goes, it goes way back in, in a way it's interlocked with Sherry Washburn. Uh, when he was trying to recruit me, he was dangling various things in front of me as if he needed to, but uh, I had assumed that I was going to do hunter-gatherers. And he said, I will guarantee, if you'll go and do this baboon job for me, I will guarantee you that I will get you a Ford Foundation grant to go to the pygmies. And it will be wonderful because they're in the Park Albert, they're now being allowed to hunt so long as they hunt with natural weapons. And he was a good friend of a man named Francois Boulier, who was oh, yeah. head of two institutes in Paris, wonderful man, who came and visited me in Nairobi Park, and we had a fabulous time there anyway. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but then, uh, by the time I got back, and uh, I, you know, I, I was on the back of a tiger or a baboon, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was hard to get off. And by the time I could, uh, Richard Lee had applied to come to Berkeley, where I was teaching with Sherry, and uh, to work with us. And uh, uh, he had an MA from Toronto, and so on. And Sherry and I talked it over and decided to admit him. He was quite excited about it. And uh, well, so <clears throat> Richard Lee comes and he thinks in order to work with us, he's got to do by, well, he's got to do primates. Perfectly reasonable assumption since everybody else working with me was doing that. But he told me that his real dream was to do hunter gatherers. And I said, Richard, you, you're, this is your lucky day. <laughs> It's exactly what I want to do, so let's plan it together. So he became the point man and, and uh, you know, putting things together and goading me along. Uh, not, yeah, and uh, it was an incredible experience. And because of my own attitudes in social anthropology, I had a lot to live up to. But even for Richard and me, uh, we had been told pretty much what to expect, because everybody's in hunter-gatherers and so on. So they were going to be patrilineal, tracing through males, uh, patrilocal, uh, live around the father, uh, territorial, and exogamous. There were none of those things, the Bushmen. Uh, their kinship was not strictly patrilineal or matrilineal. It was bilateral, like ours, in fact. Uh, there are many, many aspects of the Kung San that are just like uh, American middle class, uh, nuclear family orientation, but within uh, a large group of close relatives. That, and that's the part that we've hived off, of course. Uh, and um, uh, small groups, et cetera. Well, we, the other thing we had been told, well, we knew it was kind of a, chestnut in anthropology that the big difference between hunter-gatherer way of life and what came later is specialization and mm -hmm. uh, every male hunter in the band knows how to do all of the same things that another male does so they're interchangeable same thing for the women you know the, the weaving and the food gathering okay. well that was silly too I mean these people fr from the first day I mean, of course, I didn't speak the language, but we had a very good interpreter. And from the first day, it was clear 
that these people were as different as any middle class community in Massachusetts that I ever encountered. And they even had specialists, not just cures, which you sort of expected, but even that was strange because every young man was expected to practice doing a trance dance and if possible go into a trance because in that state he could then heal people. Mm. And the remarkable thing is that probably a quarter of all young men did become trancers of one ilk or another. Some great famous ones, but a lot of them were serious trancers, which is much higher percentage than any other group I know mm. who have medicine men and sort of. Uh, but the, there were uh, specialists among the, the son, which it just blew me away. I, I uh, sitting around the campfire at night after we'd been there a while, and I, I look up at the stars and I say, so what do you make of all that? Well, what do you want? I said, well, a Milky Way. Well, that's the backbone of the sky, okay. And all those little pinpricks of light, what, what's that? Oh, well, those are dead men's eyes. I said, well, that's kind of uh, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, th this is what any Bushman would tell you. So this is kind of very like if you ask some <clears throat> young person in Cambridge, you know, what's up there, they wouldn't tell you much more than that. Maybe mm. Venus and the moon. Uh, and uh, so, But I kept pushing because I'd read a paper by the Marshall family, who was the family who'd been studying Bushman just across the border, about cosmology and that it was rich. And they finally said in exasperation, well, why don't you go over to King's Band and ask Tinka, because he's the one that knows all about the stars. Well, I'm from Missouri, so to speak, and uh, I, was, I, I was very uh, suspicious throughout most of our studies because it's so easy to try to, Every group you go to tries very hard to find out what is it you want to know, want to hear, right. and give it to you. And they're very good at it because they've had a lot of practice with <laughs> groups that are more powerful than they. And uh, so I, re I remain skeptical throughout most of the song study because, uh, well, we, we really wanted to just get the facts, ma'am, just the facts. and. We didn't want to overlay it with theory. We uh, didn't want to bleed the witness, and we kept each other on it. So that wasn't hard because we, uh, Richard and I, both very empirically oriented. Uh, so we developed methods of interviewing and so on, in which you'd interview interview a woman about important events in her life, and say you'd spend all day one day and half the next day. Then you would interview her sisters and her mother and her grandmother and go over the same incidents and see what their point of view was. And we found the, the Bushman remarkably candid and honest and so on. That we also found that they had, uh, they could repress things, uh, understandably, like uh, an infant that had died in birth or uh, they'd had to commit infanticide with, it was terrible crushing thing, but their female relatives knew about it. Well, anyway, uh, you go over, oh, and there was another another guy who, who was the plant expert. Now, every Bushman, man or woman, can name for you the 20 most common plants and the 20 most common animals, and that's about it. Well, <laughs> this guy could rattle off a son, a son name for everything. Mm. And I thought, oh boy, this guy's really putting us on. He's going to expect a big gift. But we checked it out, and there was another guy who knew a lot of, and they were the same words. Hmm. And the same went with cosmology, although we didn't have another cosmologist to check it with, but at least he was consistent from the decade before. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I've taken too long on this, but I'm just trying to say the Bushmen were so rich and we saw these poor people have not been well represented and we're not gonna be able to do that very well all by ourselves. So we proposed this broad range thing of ecology and archeology span and, and uh, kinship and 
uh, everything, uh, child rearing, uh, medicine, and so on. Uh, and we also, and we were able to sell it because we had this mantra almost, which is, you know, for 100,000 years, or certainly more, but at least, we were hunter-gatherers. And we've only been something else in the last 10,000 years. And as late as the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago, half the world was still hunter-gatherers. So we're really hunter-gatherers. Never mind, some of us wear Brooks Brothers suits. And we don't know that life. We, and we have completely misinterpreted it. And so one of the first gee whiz things we found, or, or golly, was uh, that the women were on average throughout the year bringing in more calories to the camp than the men were. And all the models of hunter-gatherers had been people hungry all the time. Well, they are kind of hungry, but, you know, but hunters getting game was not an everyday occurrence, so you kind of staggered from one antelope to the next to stay alive. It's just not that way at all. Uh, first of all, we found that they eat more meat than Americans. It's just that it has only a quarter of the fat in it, or less. They're lean people chasing lean animals. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but, but the women were bringing in rich foods, and especially mungongo nuts, which are extremely rich and very abundant out there. And uh, there, It takes a lot of technology to roast them and crack them, but they have more protein than beefsteak and, and more fat than uh, bacon. So on, you know, so all by themselves, they're very good. Well, I, I, you, you've got me talking about, uh, as you can see, I can talk about these things forever, but that was why our project became so popular. Oh, that and we chose who to go out there very a Remarkable carefully. people, a remarkable cohort of people came <laughs> out of that project. Yeah, they're, now they're members of the National Academy and you know, chairman of department, anyway. I'm so proud of them. Uh, and we, we, had a, we set up a model uh, training program, which was this. We, as you said, uh, we did not want to swamp the Bushmen, destroy you know, the Heisenberg effect. We didn't, we didn't want to destroy the very data we came out to gather. And uh, so we would take, the idea was just one couple, uh, sorry, two couples at a time. And one of those would be Lee and his wife, or me and my wife, whatever. Anyway, then that couple would come back, and we there was a seminar going on all the time on the Bushmen. So the ones who'd been to the field would then teach the ones who were preparing to go out. So that engendered a lot of in-group bonding, and we also set up a master file, and uh, Richard and I went to the National Cash Register, and they had uh, a, a patent on uh, pressure paper that w would make carbons. And we had uh, two crates of notebooks printed with uh, three, uh, three pages, uh, original and two carbons. And the original went into the master file, which was open to everybody. That was a really big wow. change. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a carbon for the person and a carbon to do whatever he wanted to with. Uh, and that more or less worked. I mean, n nothing ever works perfectly, but that was, that was pretty close. Uh, we, we used something very like that some years later with the Whitings to do a six-culture six study of adolescence, seven-culture. Uh, yeah, and that, those, those studies... To say pioneered so much not only the this multidisciplinary approach but I hadn't realized that even sort of antedates the the open access data and and uh, uh, file sharing as it were that was that was uh, going on back then and and uh, it's it's not hard to appreciate why the Kung San became such a paradigm within anthropology. I mean, there, there were, they were hunter-gatherers for, for so many uh, people and for so many generations because there was no, no other study that came close to the richness of the 
the detail. And no, that's right. I don't know of any culture outside the West uh, as has as much fine-grained uh, data on it. I mean, probably 30 books by now, and I, I, I can't keep right. up with it all. Right, and and especially and it's still going on. I was I was fortunate to to uh, get on the tail end of that with uh, another project that you started with Bob Bailey, <laughs> finally getting you to the Aturi Forest and uh, <laughs> some encounters with the pygmies. Uh, were they what you expected when you when you finally got there? I didn't have the same expectations because they were not as nominally well known. I mean, mm -hmm. After all, the Bushmen had been described by Elizabeth Thomas and Thomas mm -hmm. people and so on. And by, I won't name all the people. Uh, <coughs> but uh, the irony of this was, uh, yeah, I did finally make it, uh, make it to the Pygmies, but for years people would say, can't we join your Kalahari project? And we would say, well, no, we're kind of full up, which was true. Uh, but for heaven's sakes, this is a dry savanna adaptation. It's, it can't, it's silly to have this stand for all hunter-gatherers everywhere in all times, just because it's the best documented, like the drunk looking for his keys where the light is. <laughs> uh, and, um, so I said, why don't you go study the pygmies? I mean, that's the next biggest intact hunter-gatherer uh, population. Well, the pygmies are still somewhat enigmatic, but even their language, but uh, they, uh, th their culture makes, absolutely makes sense but we just didn't know what to expect. Uh, and what we found was that uh, the pygmies, as they'd always been said to be, were always uh, in a very close relationship with some uh, Bantu or Sudanic-speaking group, uh, patrons, so to speak, uh, intermarrying. Yeah. I spent very little time out there, uh, but Bob Bailey, who was the Richard Lee of mm -hmm. the Pygmies, and uh, his wife, Nadine, uh, got a PhD in our department, were the key people. Right. But we also, I bet the, the time I remember most vividly was when we got Richard Wrangham out there for a while, and his wife, and they studied the uh, <coughs> Lesse hosts while Nadine and Bob studied the F.A. Pygmies. And we would have seminars every night where we would hash out how we were going to describe behavior and resting and moving and so on so that they could be compared. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, and it was very exciting, really, because we wanted to know things like amount of leisure time, on that contribution of male versus female or adolescent, you know, the, all that the, in fine grain. And so we would, sometimes they would act these things out. They said, well, if, if a mother is squats down by the fire, then hops up and goes to her baby and then comes back by the fire, how do you code that? <laughs> well, I would do so, you know, so, do we need to break that down into squats? And so, no, let's don't do that. You know, uh, well, I'm just pulling that out of the air, but right. uh, they were exciting seminars. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Richard, who I, I idolize, uh, I think is one of the best uh, uh, people for methodology, uh, that the biology or anthropology has, has produced for whole animal uh, studies, and all these people are so good. Yeah. I mean, I was, everything I did, I learned from my students. I, I learned very early on that if you wanted wisdom, it chances are you wanted to go to the faculty. But if you want to know what's really going on in the field, you go to the graduate students because they have so much on the line. That they know they have to be up to date on the literature, or, and, and they want to be also. And they're not uh, jaded, they're not burnt out. Right. So I surrounded myself with graduate students and the, 
the epitome of that was something that came to be called the Simeon Seminar. And the Simeon Seminar was uh, actually suggested by one of the graduate students. I was having, every chance I got, I would snag a, a prominent biologist or anthropologist, Jane Goodall or uh, whatever, uh, to come through uh, to come and, and give an uh, informal talk in my living room and invite the graduate students. Then they needed to give talks to each other and uh, we wanted more local people. So, so it turns out that <laughs> I had a meeting like that on average twice a month in the living room. And uh, it got bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until we were finally getting 40 and 50 squeezed into. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those Rather days. Rather modest way. A lot of sitting on the floor and on each other's laps because we showed slides and the whole shtick. But that living room and that seminar, the Simeon Seminar became the, the crucible uh, for so many uh, ideas and so many, and, and so during that period, I think also, uh, you started working closely uh, with Robert Trivers, E.O. Yeah. Uh, e. Wilson, students of your own like uh, Sarah Hurdy, and in, in incorporating into anthropology, into the study of human behavior, some of the very exciting new Darwinian synthesis that was coming from uh, from D. W. Hamilton and J. Maynard Smith and and uh, and uh, G. C. Williams and 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 you all were pulling that together into what became uh, known uh, for a while as as sociobiology and generated quite a stir, uh, especially at Harvard. Yeah, especially at Harvard. <laughs> Uh, did did were you? I don't know. Were you surprised by that stir, or did it, did you ever worry that you'd that you'd poked a hornet's nest? I kind of suspected that it wouldn't go down easily, partly by my own experience. I mean, uh, Trivers led me in this from the beginning, and and, and most importantly, all the way through. But uh, I'll never forget. He called me up. We often got together for sometimes all night sessions in my house. And uh, the, he called me on a Thursday night. And he says, Irv, you know, I've been wanting to tell you this. I've just been reading such exciting stuff. And here's what it is. And he can be very uh, straight to the point, And he's clear. But, and he was. But this stuff was so novel. It blew my mind. And I, but you know, my basic attitude, this is the very first time I heard of, of modern evolutionary biology as, as we now understand it, was take two aspirin and call me again Monday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, I'm, a, I'm stubborn and I think I'm careful and, and I, I don't embrace a belief uh, in theory or uh, so in the broadest sense. Uh, until I'm completely convinced, and then I hold on to it tightly. I don't mm -hmm. abandon it easily. Mm -hmm. Well, what Trivers was saying to me was so fundamental, uh, was challenging, that I realized very quickly within weeks that in order to embrace it fully, I would have to turn my back on everything I'd understood until that point. Mm -hmm. The, in anthropology. I, my thesis, my professors, including Washburn, mm -hmm. uh, and, and this was such a scary step to take. And I was actually in the uh, transition generation, so to speak. Uh, Robert Hind in England and Peter Marler at Berkeley, who were friends of mine, were both students of Thorpe, and <clears throat> they were now coming into their own, and they were the great paragons of right. behavioral biology. And they didn't like this at all, because they were going to have to change the way they looked at the world as well. And they took a long time. Uh, Peter finally came around, but Hein still used to get up and make embarrassing statements about me 
in meetings. <laughs> but uh, uh, I was right that it, it, and I, unfortunately, I use the expression conversion experience, but what I meant, I didn't mean anything mystical by that, but, you know, Saul on the road to Tarsus has a vision, and he, he folds down his soul and he stands up, he's Paul the Apostle. And that's how, what a wrench it was. Mm. And, but once you began to get it and you realized that this was a theory so much more powerful than anything we'd had before that you could actually now predict things. If you knew several things about a species, you could make a very uh, likely assumption, probably that you're going to find these things as well. And not all of them, but it turns out that most of them were. So the world began to make sense. And very curious, anomalous behaviors suddenly were understandable. Right. Uh, but it, it couldn't have come at a worse time for social anthropology because I think social anthropology had largely lost its way. It, they were not, the foreign markets, so to speak, villages were more and more closed to them. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, they were doing some, basically some sociology that was quite good. Uh, but they, they were also doing a lot of um, philosophical, plain language, uh, I don't know, I don't even know how to characterize it, but uh, f things that led to such silly conclusions as there is no such thing as truth, there's no objective truth. Everything we know or believe is filtered through a culture. To, well, of course it is, but that doesn't mean that in physics there is no such thing as truth. It goddamn well is. <laughs> uh, so, so what, what, what is sociobiology? Well, <laughs> glad you asked. Uh, the essence of it is very, very simple. Darwin saw uh, very clearly, as we now know, uh, the operation of natural selection on individuals and how it shaped them in niches and environments and so on, how they competed. And that's, that tells most of the story we need to know about most behavior. But now that it, genetics is so important in our understanding, we realize that behavior that is inherited in the genes is not just inherited from the grandparents and the parents down to the kids. But in fact, it's the genes that are traveling down and it, it affects all the people who are connected to you by genes from common descent. So your cousins, uh, you're one-eighth related to them. Your nephew and niece, you're one-quarter. Your kids, one-half. Uh, and that whole bundle, and we usually stop at about cousins because eighth is about as far as anybody wants to do the math. Uh, <clears throat> but that, so that whole bundle around ego uh, is the uh, inclusive fitness, uh, kin selection it used to be called. And uh, once you have that, then that helps you understand even more about behavior. Strange things like uh, uh, birds who uh, grow up, uh, but the next spring they don't go off and found their own nest and so on. They stay with the parents and help rear them. Now, why do they do that? Well, because it turns out that you know they share genes with their parents and with the parents' kids, new kid, new girl, and uh, that if you do the math, uh, it makes sense for them to do that because nesting sites and so on are scarce. Well, one of the, uh, we had a whole bunch of sterling people in the Simeon Seminar, and one couple who I got to know very, very well uh, was uh, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby. Ah, yes. When John Tooby applied to Harvard, uh, he was out at Stanford, in Palo, he was at Palo Alto, and I was going out there to a center uh, function of some sort. And uh, we had lunch, 
And he started, uh, we, I started interviewing him to see if he was suitable to come to Harvard. Because I, I really feel strongly not to admit anybody without an interview. And uh, uh, I suddenly realized about 15, 20 minutes into this, that I'm not interviewing him. He's interviewing me. <laughs> I thought, well, let's move this guy <laughs> to take over and be sure that I, you know, it, uh, well, of course, I admired it. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's, those stories are told about Edmund Land and uh, the faculty at MIT. He just got fed up with them and stalked off and invented Polaroid. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, where was I? Oh, Tubi and Cosmides have written a whole series of very influential papers. Uh, I, I wrote a very early one with John, uh, but the heart, and they gave a name to what we should be thinking about is not natural selection or even kin selection, uh, inclusive fitness, because behavior is not inherited, genes are inherited. And then within environments that bit differ, the gene gets expressed. So we've been leaving out that, that middle connection. Uh, <clears throat> and we, we've uh, sloppily talked about uh, genes for such and such behavior being inherited. Well, it's not strictly speaking true. Genes that will tend to, pr to make it easier for the animal to follow that pathway in some environments are what's inherited. And that makes a difference too, as it turns out. And that's, that's, it's clear that it does because it's caught on like wildfire. And one of the interesting, uh, Lita, by the way, uh, graduated from Harvard, they're married now uh, and, uh, in psychology and John in anthropology. Well, calling it evolutionary psychology was a brilliant stroke, not only a good descriptor, but uh, suddenly psychology began to feel like it was part of the enterprise. And, with a, an open door that they could come into without losing face or anything else. Mm -hmm. So the transition there is so much easier than it was in uh, behavior sense, in the strict sense or anthropology. Anthrop I was, I tried to be a bridge between sociobiology and anthropology, but boy, they made it hard. Uh, I had a lot of sympathy for them because uh, I go back to a time when there were still very angry debates over uh, racism and uh, mm -hmm. ideology and uh, especially genetic determinism, which is, of course is terribly ill-informed. But that had, that had reared its head so many times, <coughs> excuse me, genetic determinism about humans over the years, sometimes with dreadful results like the Holocaust. Uh, that the social sciences were just spooked as hell about it. And I don't blame them because never had biology done them any favor. It had done nothing but cause tragedy and they had nothing to take from it. And so they tried to turn sociobiology into yet another manifestation of the old fashioned, just more sophisticatedly put. And it was not that at all. Right. And uh, ironically, we had in uh, Dick Lewinton and Steve Gould, the two of the most outspoken critics of sociobiology, and then in Ed Wilson and Trivers, a bunch of us, uh, outstanding proponents of it. And <laughs> all actually within wings of the same building. <laughs> and things got a little dicey for a while. Uh, but I think the, I think the thing is, is over. And anthropology has come to the point, I think, where uh, more and more uh, people have embraced the fundamental principles uh, in social organization, so on, of sociobiology, and uh, and seen that it's it's not uh, a ship, you know, it's not a terrible thing. It's something that you can <laughs> grow accustomed to, and may even give you some insights. Uh, and there are some who don't accept anything and will never. 
And I, I say I actually have sympathy for them too, but I think they're terribly misinformed, or as Ed Wilson would say, willfully ignorant. <laughs> they're willing to remain willfully ignorant, which pretty well describe, well, never mind, fundamentalists in evolution, let's not go there. Uh, <coughs> the um, anthropology is going to continue to grow apart. I, I tried to look up today how many anthropologists there are in uh, faculties and universities now. It's in the thousands, I don't know. Uh, when I first, my first two or three meetings I went to in anthropology, national meetings, were so small and intimate, you, you could know by name almost everyone there except mm -hmm. the students showing up for the first time, of course, and they, we all had on name tags. And uh, so there was a real sense of camaraderie, and it was a, it was a feeling about anthropology, uh, mutually supportive, in which there was an agreement that we, we do cultural anthropology, which is to say we do physical anthropology, archaeology, social anthropology, and linguistics, at least those four. And that had grown out of the, the giants in this country, like uh, Boaz and, and Krober and so on. Uh, and so it went under the banner of cultural anthropology. And they used to have very serious debates in anthropology over whether we were cultural anthropologists or social anthropologists. And so I, well, come on, mm. folks. Well, who cares? As long as we, but. Uh, I, I did come to realize several things. Uh, one is that American anthropology was basically based on salvage anthropology, salvage ethnography, mm. because the way of life was long gone. The Indians had been herded onto reservations. So, so you picked the oldest people to be your informants and found a chair under shade of a tree and you sat there and tell me about the old days. And of course they were only too happy to tell you about the good old days and it's almost as bad as asking a fundamentalist to, to tell you about the Garden of Eden. You know, <laughs> because and, uh, and it wasn't that people were trying to mislead anybody, it's just that the roseate hue of the past is right. hard to get past. Whereas the social anthropologists in England couldn't have been a bigger contrast. First of all, they weren't students, they were adults. Second of all, they were all basically minions of the State Department, the British Foreign Office. And uh, they were studying cultures which are absolutely vital, ongoing, and the British had a very rambunctious empire run and they wanted to know what is all this stuff about the golden stool in West Africa and Ghana and so on. So, <clears throat> so you had people who could barely hang on to the facts of social anthropology. And so, so they didn't have time for child development, archaeology, all those things. So you had the division grow up between the two, uh, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. But uh, I think now, uh, well, as, as we know, because you were one of the instrumental people in doing it, uh, the so-called biological anthropology split apart from the anthropology department here quite recently. Mm -hmm. And it will have 14 faculty members when it's fully staffed. It's got 10 of those now, as I recall. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It was a dream, it was an apple of my eye. <clears throat> I, when I was chair, I finally bit the bullet and divided the department into three wings, we call them, archaeology, social, and biological, because uh, as long as people with such divergent interests, uh, who had almost no interests in common, but just camaraderie, uh, you, know, and you can't get very far on that past a cup of coffee. Uh, fought over all the resources. Number of graduate students could be admitted, uh, um, number of junior faculty, uh, support for graduates, and so on. So uh, faculty meetings are rancorous, and got, so I just sat down, took the resources of the three, and announced we now had three 
different wings. And each had a wing chairman who reported to me, <laughs> and I reported to the dean. Uh, and that was the first big fissure in the Balcones fault zone. <laughs> Uh, and it's now come about as far as it's going to go for a while. Uh, well, if I knew where the future of anthropology was, I wouldn't be in it. I would be on the stock market <laughs> in New York. But uh, I think it will survive, but it will survive because it has been somewhat adroit at changing with the time. Uh, when I first came to Harvard, we couldn't hire a a paleoanthropologist because there were just three, four fossils, and yeah, there was no, there were no jobs, uh, and so on. The undergraduates all wanted to have a course, but that was it, you know. And now, half the physical anthropologists are working for the paleontologists. We got so many fossils, such a different world. That's uh, what geezers always say, but it is strange. <laughs> Well, wherever the future of anthropology lies, uh, if it flourishes, and if it's adept at changing, some of that, I think, can really be traced back to your influence and your career and the, the pivotal changes that, that you saw go on uh, as you were shifting ground from primate behavior to hunter-gatherer studies to sociobiology to evolutionary psychology. And, the, and even though the department at Harvard may have split into two now. I think the, the grand vision of, of some really sophisticated, complicated, synthetic understanding of human beings as animals, as very complex social yeah. beings, uh, remains very alive and vital in the field. Well, I, I agree. and, and uh people are becoming more open-minded. I think partly, the, the more you can separate the, your vital territory and feel comfortable in that and feel like it's respected, the more you can then reach out. And uh, now John Whiting did a lot toward teaching me that. He and mm. Beatrice were very close to me and uh, I collaborated with him in several cross-cultural, uh, what, what he liked to call Jet Age Anthropology. Uh, <laughs> with more or less good results. Well, uh, my father was a minister, as was yours, as I recall. That's correct. And uh, he always said not many souls were saved after five o'clock, so I think it's time to call this one off. <laughs> That's all right. That's excellent. 